Uh, ginger ale. Yum, my favorite. I am thrilled to have you here. You know, you, you are the consummate actor, director, teacher. You've worked in this business for decades, and I know that you have so much to share with our actors today. Uh, Let's see. So. Yeah, I mean, you have a movie coming out this week, Rosebud Lane. We're going to get to that. That's that's the most exciting, of course. But let's let's talk about your acting. Um, okay. Wow. Uh, tell us uh, wh where'd you come from? How'd you get to Hollywood? And how have you been a successful working actor for so many years in Hollywood? Uh, that's, yeah, that's really a great question because there, there really isn't a magic bullet, but there are some things that I think are consistent with, with those of us who do manage to kind of continue to, to work. So I'll try to, you know, uh, make it brief, but, uh, but helpful for your, for your audience. Came out here in 88 to 87, actually, to pursue acting immediately. Uh, fortunate enough to get an agent through, through a friend and just kind of hit the ground running. So I did have some things bounce my way early. Not going to lie. Uh, it's always great to have relationships and people that are looking to help you out. So I had a little bit of that early on and just uh, right out of the gate was uh, doing uh, commercials and sitcoms and stuff uh, that, that kind of fit my lane of where I was as an actor. What um, was your lane I, I then? Lunge, what was your lane then? Uh, big jock, big dumb jock, <laughs> kind of Dolph Lundgren type football player, corn fed, Midwestern, uh, you know, handyman, guy next door, football jock. Uh, and there was a, there was a lot of that on sitcoms back back in the in the uh, early '90s. And were you okay with that? Did you embrace yeah, it? Yeah, because I, I knew that my my training certainly wasn't anything to to uh, be impressed by. I didn't I didn't you know go to any university or have any any formal training. I, uh, I, I you know in college I'd studied to be a journalist like you, and go into mass communications. Dropped out of college, moved to Hawaii for a couple of years, and then decided to pursue acting. So I knew that I had a lot of work to do to get to a point where I deserved better opportunities than the ones I was initially getting. So right, you know, uh, the first chapter of my career was very much just capitalizing on my look, um, whatever I was bringing, some kind of Midwestern innocence, a wholesome quality to, to these big knucklehead characters that I was playing. But it was really just, you know, establishing relationships with casting directors and proving that I could you know, do the work and be professional about it. And then as the training starts to accelerate and you start to take things more seriously and you look around and decide, you know, what kind of actor do you want to be? Do you want to go the, the groundlings route and do sketch comedy? Do you want to go, you know, something like the actor's gang, which I know you're very familiar with and go into right. that kind of theater? Mm -hmm. Or do you want to uh, do the conventional stage work, um, scene study classes, cold reading classes? So many options. That was more... Yeah, there are options, and I think it's very important for actors to look around and to sample a lot of things before they kind of zero in on one type of technique. 100%. Meisner technique ended up being, yeah, Meisner was introduced to me early on, and it really spoke to me in terms of uh, just a, a tangible, accessible playbook for how to um, create characters, bring emotional life to the work, have a uh, have a like you know a playbook like I said the the Meisner book is great for it that is. it really does give you fundamentals and and building block um, things that you can build upon to understand how to get into text analyze text create a character and deliver something on stage so I did a lot of stage work in the beginning of my career jumped around from different theater companies started a few different companies with friends and I just uh, I never shortchanged that part of my career. I was always looking to be up on stage, and I think that's really valuable so, for actors to so not important. shortcut around that. Yeah. So so as you're listening to this, everyone, you know these are keys not only how to make it, but for longevity. And I think that's something that's not talked enough about in in life in podcasts. Yeah. Like, okay, how do we make it? Everyone wants to know. But then, how do you stay in it? Because it's a business that goes up and down. And, you know, the question is, how do you ride the wave? And these are some of the ways to stay inspired. Yeah, and it's and, and often the things that, that keep us going, Rachel, as you know, are validation. We need validation to know that we've made a good career choice, that, that there is going to be some kind of uh, revenue, uh, that you're going to make some money. And you need to have these reinforcing validations along the way. But they're few and far between. Oh, they are. You have these, Sometimes you don't get you them. Have, Exactly, and and when and and when they when they only come in the form of a booking, or a residual check, or 
um, something that, that you can kind of draw a straight line to and say, wow, I'm going to make money doing this. You have to create a lifestyle that validates you in other areas, whether it's, you know, being in, always working on play readings with friends or being in a class where you're engaged with people, writing content, sharing content, doing things, reaching out to people, collaborating with as many people as possible. And you'll find that validation comes in all sorts of forms. Yes. And you have to nurture that and cultivate that so that when you have these gaps in between either booking jobs or something professionally happening, which is inevitable, you need to have this lifestyle in place where you're always like, like, like you, you're, you're, a, you're you know, a perfect example of that, where you're just always doing something. Mm -hmm. You're always looking to collaborate on the next project mm -hmm. and, and put uh, people together in a room that are, that are, that are working towards uh, storytelling yes absolutely and, and that's that's available that's available to every actor mm -hmm. to put those habits into place but anyway it's, it's easier said than it's easier said than done but every actor has that uh, you know available to them every day is to change change your habits so that you're in a place of constantly thinking about creating content collaborating with people looking for opportunities putting yourself in places where you're going to meet people uh, that's that's the stuff actors just we have to do it um, and it's it, it, it doesn't pay it doesn't pay off Im immediately you don't you don't see the dividends immediately but the, over time they build up over decades I have to say like doing over this decades. podcast I'm back in touch with all these producers yeah. that I lost touch with and now we're coming together on projects I mean decades and yeah. and the enthusiasm still there and somehow we lost touch like our lives went different yeah. ways and there was, but you made an impression. There was something. There was a spark, right, a creative spark between us. Uh, I want to talk about some of your credits because uh, okay. John is, is speaking like, like the common man, the artist. But let's talk about, like, yeah. I mean, Hollywood has embraced you completely. You started off with Dogfight. What an enormous yeah. film. Uh, these are some of your credits, uh, which I'm reading back to you. Zodiac, NYPD Blue, Criminal Minds, Son of Anarchy, Hell on Wheels, Assassination of Gianni Versace, which um, you can check out on John's IMDb clips of that. Phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Just Mercy. Uh, something new called A Man in Full on Netflix. And then yeah. really the icing on all of our cakes is The Joker. The brand new movie yeah. with Joaquin Phoenix, Lady Gaga, which you spent, I believe, almost two months on this year. Just over two months. Uh, uh, November, December. And then into January, so uh, really just a, a dream job for you know obvious NDA uh, reasons. They're, they don't want us to share details of it, but yeah. just a, a phenomenal job to spend you know that kind of prolonged time working with people like Joaquin Phoenix and Brendan Gleeson, um, uh, George Carroll. What did you learn? I mean, I know you can't tell us about the movie, but what did you take away as an actor from that experience? Uh, preparation, preparation and focus, which are things that I teach all the time in my studio. Um, preparation, focus, these are the, the things that are mandatory. They're the baseline for your prep and bringing your work to the camera or the stage is you have to be you know, in, in intense concentration and, and putting yourself in a place of not being distracted or, or knocked off your game and to watch Joaquin Phoenix every day for, you know, the better part of two months his preparation, his his attention to detail, his his thoughtful approach with this just intense focus on the work and 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 not allowing any external elements or distractions to knock him off his game. I mean, when Joaquin is on set, it's it's go time, and he's just he's all there. He's all there, and and, and he's constantly in this in this place of being free and giving himself permission to create really really fantastic work. So to see it up close was, was just really a treat. And he's a sweetheart of a guy. He, you know, you, you don't talk much to him when, when you're working. He's very locked in, but he gives you a pat on the back when you need it. And uh, just a, a sweetheart of a guy. And I can't say enough about Lady Gaga. She's a doll. Really, a, really a nice person. People are going to love this film. Uh, the word is getting out now. You're, they're starting to leak images on Instagram and social media. People are finding out that it's a musical, and there's a lot of backlash saying, "Oh, this is that's the worst idea ever." Uh, release or uh, dismiss any preconceived notions you have of this being a standard musical. It's it's phenomenal. People are going to love it. And it's a phenomenal director, right? They're in good hands with this. Yeah, Todd Phillips is great. He directed the first one. 
um, just a really steady, you know, uh, capable craftsman of a, of a director. Surrounds himself with great people. Uh, and he's, he, yeah, Todd, Todd Phillips is, is fantastic. Just really, really happy to work with that whole group. It was, it was a dream job for sure. John, what a way yeah. to start the year working on the Joker. Yeah, and, 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 and 22, it was, yeah, it was a great, it was a perfect over, overlap from one year to the next for sure. Wow. Wow. Congratulations. I'm so happy about Thank that. Thank you, Rachel. Um, Thank you. So, okay. You've got the acting career. You know, I know you're constantly auditioning and you've got the great reps, everything's in place. And then there's this other side of John Lacey, the director. And you bring a quality to your work that is really inspired by the legends. If you follow John on Instagram, you know he's a huge movie lover and constantly exposing yourself to new films, old films. But I want to talk about your new movie, Rosebud Lane. Uh, I know you're inspired by the best of the best, and I want to compare you. I want to put you in the same category as John Huston, Sam Peckinpah, wow. John Raffleson, Raffleson, excuse me, and of course my favorite, John Cassavetes. Yeah, There's big a influences for sure. Huge influences that you've shared with me and that I can see in your work because I got to see Rosebud Lane at a screening in a festival uh, in LA. And so I can proudly say that it's a gorgeous film. And Thank you. That your homage to these directors and your old Hollywood style of being, <laughs> your persona and your art is evident in that film. So tell us about Rosebud Lane. Thank you. Oh, that's, those are that's such nice compliments. I really appreciate it. And I'm so glad you got to see the film. Uh, we released on Friday on Amazon, uh, Google Play, Vudu, and iTunes. So this Friday, it's available to the public. I wrote Rosebud Lane at the beginning of 2020, before the pandemic. So I was at a, at a, a place where I wrote the film to take place in a small town in North Carolina where my mother was living at the time and with her uh, getting getting along in her years and, and with not great health, I really wanted to put myself in a position where I was in North Carolina with my mom. So I wrote the film to take place in small town Hendersonville, North Carolina. The pandemic hits and as we all know, our, everyone's world was turned upside down and travel was no longer yeah. available. Everyone was uh, quarantining and whatnot. Uh, I stuck with my plan to to be in North Carolina by November of 2020. So I, I didn't let any of uh, what was happening discourage me. And I don't know why I was so brazenly optimistic without ever flinching that I could pull it off. But I just I just never flinched. I just stuck with my dates as we cast the film, as we found the young boy that we needed for the picture to work. We needed, a, it's a father-son story, so we really needed a good little uh, 10, 11-year-old boy we, we were gonna cast out of Atlanta or North Carolina. We found him, put my cinematographer and my crew uh, in place. And once we set the dates to shoot in November in North Carolina, we just stuck with it. And somehow, miraculously, we got our LA actors out there. Wow, and in everything the midst worked. of COVID, everyone got on and airplanes and we're, you had someone on set, which we have now, right? What are they called, the person who? So COVID captains. COVID yeah. captain, and you made a movie. Wow. Mm. Um, Shot it in 14, 14 days in North Carolina, and we wrapped the beginning of 2021 in LA, three days. So 17 total shoot days to make a feature film uh, with really fantastic actors. Our two leads, uh, Brad Abril and, and Tyne Steckline, will blow you away. Little boy that we cast in North Carolina named Bronson Leader. Just a very natural screen presence, very likable. Tess Harper, who a lot of people are familiar with mm -hmm. from, from Tender Mercies and Oscar nominated from Crimes of the Heart. She plays a, a supporting role and is, is, is every bit what you expect from Tess. Uh, Josh Doherty, Wes Robertson, uh, Ashley St uh, Stevens, uh, just Ashley Evans, great cast. Mm. Um, so I hope, uh, hope your fans can, can find their way to Amazon and, and uh, either rent it or purchase it this weekend. I've already pre-ordered it. So I pre-ordered it. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. But um, yeah, really, it's, it's for $10, you're going to own this gorgeous movie. Um, so people can rent it to play, just the movie itself, starting this mm -hmm. weekend. Okay. Mm -hmm. Friday. Starting Friday. Okay. And um, let's talk about 
this. This is, uh, you've, in addition to Rosebud Lane, you created two web series, and then you had another movie that's rentable. Yes, the, 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 the progression of me being able to make back-to-back -back features for 100000 I, I started focusing on being uh, more than an actor in the early 90s. It was, it, this didn't come just recently. I was writing scripts mm. and putting projects together all the way back in 93, 94, like most filmmakers that don't have, uh, you know, a, a budget and don't have uh, connections, and you're literally starting from scratch. Several projects died on the vine, but I, I did have a couple of different feature film projects in the '90s that taught me a lot, but never got to the marketplace. And they, like I said, they died in the vine. Very discouraging. So again, I turned I turned my attention back to directing in with real serious intentions back in probably. 2013, 14, and I wrote uh, a pair of web series. And, and in completing both of those web series and taking them from the page all the way to completion, getting them into festivals, uh, being online and YouTube and whatnot, I really gained the confidence that I could complete something finally and deliver it. Mm. Um, so once I had those two web series under my belt and I had this kind of new new uh, uh, confidence uh that I could assemble a team and put it all together, uh, nuts and bolts. Uh, um, yeah, I found the money. I put together the money. Uh, I cobbled it together, and I made custody in 2015, 16. Delivered that to the market in 2019. That was on Amazon for a year. Custody was uh, just about a hundred thousand dollar budget. Uh, mm. Great cast. It didn't end up uh, doing that well in terms of getting me any any of the money back that was put into it, but it was a great learning experience. I think the film holds up really well. I learned a lot, and Rosebud Lane uh, is significantly better because of custody and because of all the experiences that led up to it. So uh, for the, for filmmakers out there, any of your, you know, your fans that are aspiring filmmakers, a lot of people, make yeah. content. Just make, you know, if you have the ability to write, then always be writing. Always write your ideas down and don't edit yourself. Don't judge yourself. All, you know, just trust that if you think it's a good idea, then that's all that matters. It doesn't, it, it doesn't have to conform to any type of genre necessarily. Just write what you like and then find ways to start shooting. You know, there's so many more ways now with these phones and with all the equipment that's available. Just it, tell start. yourself that you're a storyteller and a filmmaker and just start working on it. You don't have to. I think what, what a lot of people do is when they, when they start out and they want to make a feature in particular, they'll go, well, it needs to at least have a 500 or 750 or a million dollar budget because of the way mm -hmm. it's written. And I, I, when I'm talking to those people, I just know the film's not going to ever be made because you're not going to find that kind of money. You need mm -hmm. to have a realistic approach of what, how much money could you put together with family and friends, mm -hmm. with your own sweat equity? How much could you cobble together? Do you have, uh, you know, a group of college buddies that you could get, you know, twenty five hundred each from, and suddenly there's ten thousand, and you find another ten thousand from a family member. Suddenly you have twenty thousand dollars. You can do a lot with twenty thousand bucks if you write a concept that is, mm -hmm. you know, one location, a right. simple uh, idea in terms of the amount of moving parts that you need, and you can do a lot. But I just my my suggestion to to want to be filmmakers is just go and start doing it. But make your expectations very realistic of what you're setting out to do. And then just start. And you'll, you'll realize that you learn so much and you start to build momentum. And then one thing leads to the next. And suddenly, uh, you know, I've got Rosebud Lane and I'm very proud of it. We did really well on festivals, on the festival circuit, which was great. Yeah, tell me a little bit more about Rosebud Lane. Uh, you got distribution, which is phenomenal. And yep. the I... festivals were very good to us. Yes, festivals, yeah. and then I thought I read something about the movie possibly being shown on an airplane line. Is that yep. uh, hearsay? American Airlines. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's it's not it's not locked up yet, but American Airlines it looks like they're gonna they're gonna license it. Okay. Um, so that that'll be exciting. Yeah, we have a foreign distribution company that's working every day to to get this the film licensed, you know, overseas, uh, different countries. Every country sets up its own licensing. Um, and domestically, we're with a company called Good Deed, mm -hmm. and uh, they've been great. They're very enthusiastic about the picture. They don't release more than, I think they release three to four films a year. So for us to be one of their 2023 films was, was very uh, exciting and flattering. And, uh, yeah, this Friday is uh, the official launch date. So 
you know, okay. kind of ner nervous, nervous times. I'm, I'm kind of a, I'm a little bit of a wreck. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what could go wrong at this point? I mean, you <laughs> sold the movie. Yeah. I mean, what really nothing could go wrong except people are going to watch it and enjoy it. Yeah, and they're, and they're going to leave reviews, and of course, you, you, the oh, last thing you want to do is when you're in a great mood, go and read a review, and suddenly someone's you know tearing your film down. Yeah, so there's always going to be haters. Skin. There's always going to be haters, but you know what? It it doesn't matter because I know you, John, and you stand by what you do, and you're very Thank humble you. and kind. And I I think that yeah, the work is done now, and and yeah. how it's like as an actor, how people are going to respond to you is out of your control. Like you do so what true. you do, you let it go and you let it be and have its life. And people have the opportunity to respond to it however they'd like. Ultimately, like you have given the gift, as we say, yeah. and now they get to open it and see what they take from it. Um, I know the results are, I, the responses are going to be wonderful. I know it because I've seen the movie. Can we talk about yeah. The heart and soul of this film. What is the heart and soul of Rosebud Lane? Uh, there are three things really that, that, I, that I really wanted to explore, themes that I wanted to explore, the, and then kind of a, a concept that I, was, that I was messing with. The concept was a father-son connection for the first time, a little boy who grows up in a small town in North Carolina, single mom. She's a diner waitress, uh, low income, and the little boy finds out that his father's a filmmaker in Hollywood. His biological father is a filmmaker. And the little boy grew, grew up on Rosebud Lane in small town North Carolina. I love it. And he loves, he loves old films and reaches out to his dad to form a relationship. And that, and that the part about films is you. That's you. That's little yeah. John. Very many, and and, I, and I'm, equal, I'm, I'm equal parts the filmmaker father and the little boy. Oh. Very, very, very autobiographical in that sense. So the, the dad does the right thing and flies a across the country and meets his son and they have an immediate uh, you know, shorthand of loving movies and they immediately connect. But now the father is there and he ends up being you know, caught up in the mother's conflicts and she's mm. got a few things that are going, going haywire on her. So uh, the film is about love of movies. It's about this fun of a father-son connecting with the language of cinema, which was a lot of fun for me to write and to bring okay. to it to the screen and a lot of film references, as you know, and for, for cinephiles, it's really a treat. Right, be sure to look in the background of the yeah. little boy's room, right? Yeah, Those images. A, lot of Im a lot of great images mm -hmm. and a lot of great references and quotes. But at the heart of it, beyond that is really, a, it's, a, it's a, a testament to single moms and my admiration uh, for my own single mother, uh, for her mother raising her. I dedicated the film to my grandmother, Virginia Hammock, but really it was mostly made for my mom while she was alive and, and we lost we lost my mom in October, but thankfully she was able to see the success that Rosebud Lane had in festivals. She was able to attend a couple of screenings. Mm. She saw her mom's name up on the screen oh, in the wow. dedication. Wow. She got the standing ovation. So my mother was able to see that Rosebud Lane was uh, an artistic success, whether yes. whether or not it was gonna be financial or not, my mother you know, she hopes for it, but that wasn't her interest. She she was very proud of the film. So in answer to your question, it's a father-son film. It's a, it's a film about love of cinema. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, it's about a triumphant single mom who we really pull for. And Tyne Steckline plays that character, and it's a star performance for sure. It definitely you would have been is. Great in the, you would have been great in the role, by the way, but <laughs> I we missed we out. Didn't up, we, we didn't meet up in time. We did. We didn't. <laughs> yeah. yep. you, you would have been great. I was chasing the wrong J John Lacey. Mm -hmm. Uh, another story. Isn't that funny? <laughs> Two John that Lacey's in story. Hollywood. Uh, John. Yeah, I mean, do more than that even. <laughs> so, you know, don't you think I'm listening to you? And to be honest, I didn't put it together that it's an homage to your mom. Don't you think as artists, actors, that those are the things that inspire our lives? Like the things that are closest to us, we will always return to because they are the most meaningful. Yeah, and and the truth that that you know. Every every writer is writing autobiographically. Every writer is is sharing uh, either something. I heard a uh, uh, Guillermo del Toro talking about uh, the his writing. His writing is not necessarily autobiographical from his life, but it's autobiographical from the things that his soul feels. Mm -hmm. The way his you know 
the other things that, that make us tick or yes. what he's writing about rather than just literally physically here was my childhood, you know, because mm -hmm. Alfonso Cuaron delivered Roma, which was his childhood. And now we have uh, we have Inaritu's Bardot. And those two uh, filmmakers will always be linked with Del Toro. But he was talking about the autobiographical uh, of the soul. I'm interested in, in single moms. I'm interested in, 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 sing in fatherless households and how divorce affects children. Those are themes that I'll, I will continue to explore. Hmm. Um, and I think they're universal for the most part. And that's good. We, I found we, we really have a, a, a good demographic with women. Middle-aged women are really responding to Rosebud Lane. Mm. My, my female characters are well drawn. They're tough and they stand for something. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, women, women have really been responding to Rosebud Lane. And was that by design? I mean, I guess it, it, it had to be inherently because I'm making it for my mother. Right. Your human but design. I, did, I didn't. Right. Your yeah, mother, I, your I, I sister. Yeah. 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 You didn't know it. But I didn't, right. I didn't, yeah. I didn't, I didn't set out with a target audience is what I'm saying. No. And but when we work the from the that, heart, we don't, right? Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's where we've landed. I find very, uh, rewarding and, and satisfying that, that w women love Rosebud Lane. That makes me happy. <laughs> it made me happy. Yay. Yay. I know uh, you did. You did. Your, your response was great when you saw it. That, that, uh, that was wow. very, a very good night. Yes. Yes. Very, very touching. Uh, so, okay. So we know you're going to explore divorce, mothers, fathers, any other themes in your upcoming movies, things that you want to explore whether they're from your own life or you're inspired by other filmmakers, areas to go? Yeah, I've got a, a couple of ideas. I, I really, uh, I've got a, a project that I'm pushing forward that's about Hollywood and kind of the, as much as Rosebud Lane is, is a tribute to my love of movies, there are things about Hollywood that I'm ashamed of that I, that I don't mm -hmm. find at all um, appealing or noble. Uh, the way we've cheated, treated children over the years, the, the way child actors are, are, are treated. Uh, women in general. Mm -hmm. So I do have a film that, that is that's darker and it looks at, at the, the part of Hollywood that I don't admire. Uh, and I've all, I'm also kicking around something that's much more kind of French New Wave inspired, breathless, Ooh. Uh, two, two lane black cop, kind of those movies, you know, uh, Thunderbolt and Lightfoot, uh, heist kind of fun, run and gun, guerrilla style film that I could make for you know, twenty thousand dollars in one weekend. I really, really? I'm suddenly, really inspired to do something like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm just constantly watching movies, so inspirations come to me constantly and consistently. So, mm -hmm. uh, I just, I always trust on how much, how much heat does something get when I have an inspiration and it suddenly gets a lot of heat, and I'm really thinking about it a lot, and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm suddenly fixating on it. Then I trust that, and I start to put things into motion. And if it dies on the vine or if it fades out, then that was meant to be. And it was only a temporary infatuation with that idea. Right. But when something is suddenly, it's like, oh, shit, that's what I have to do. Mm -hmm. Then I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty good at, uh, after completing two features, I'm pretty good at, at trusting that I could, uh, I could put the machinery back in place and, and get after another picture. So, so exciting. Yeah, all where, these ideas. Yes. Where is your best place to think? Where do these ideas uh, come? People say in the shower. You know, yeah, you can, you, yeah, Vince, that's funny. You can see behind me. I'm in my apartment in Santa Monica. I've got nothing but Hollywood images behind me. And uh, I've got racks and racks of DVDs. Whoa. So my, my place here in Santa Monica is just all Hollywood. Mm. So I go, to, I go to the ocean a lot. And I like to stare out the ocean and smoke a cigar and see what comes to me. Uh, I've got a lot of books that I turn to. Right now I'm reading uh, Tarantino's book on cinema speculation. Right. And that every day gives me a new idea and, and a new director that I want to research, but I'm just in a constant state of uh, stimulation absorption. If that's, yes. if, those, if those words, if those words can be attached, they can, uh, they I, can. I, I put myself in a position where I, I I'm surrounded by images and things that, that uh, you know, constantly are giving me new ideas to pursue. Hmm. So I, I try to teach, you know, I'm working on teaching that to my students. It's a very difficult thing though, to, yeah. lead people to, to do you either you either going to have that commitment to making your life the life of the artist or it's mm -hmm. going to be a hobby yeah i agree you and i are both teachers and we both have yeah. that responsibility or we try to and because we live in this full time we kind of expect that other people would like to as well but you know maybe you grow into it because uh, i always had a love for the art but uh, when you first come to town you know you're really excited to make it and be in the right places but 
it has nothing to do with that. Like you really have to have the clay to shape yourself out of. Like you have to have the raw material and you have to keep accepting life and enlarging your life and experiencing more because that's what you have to act out of. Absolutely. And you, and you and I have that very much in common where we, we love museums. We like all forms of art, dance, music. Yes. And we're, you know, from what I know of you, you're always putting yourself in a position where stimulation is just coming at you. Yes. And that's really important. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a lifestyle. It's, it's habits. It's, it's mm -hmm. uh, a, a consistent uh, attention being put on, okay, how do I fuel my art? Yes. And Hollywood's great for it. I mean, this this town gets a bad rap, but man, there's there's so much. There's a lot good to do in, in LA. LA. Yes. Yeah. A it's lot. Uh, and you know you the the longer you're here, the long the better you get at, at at separating yourself from the flakes and the people that are that are not really looking out for you or don't really care if you're successful. Or not. You you get better and better at at filtering them out and surrounding yourself only with people that are like minded. Mm -hmm. that are happy for, um, you know, whatever you're doing and want to help you and want to collaborate with you and are generous in their own, you know, um, field. And, and it's, uh, LA is great. I think so too. I think yeah. go out and take advantage of it. Whatever city you're in, you know, find the yeah. interesting and the uninteresting, like keep your eyes out. What can you experience? Something new every day. Uh, it's a way of life. It becomes a way of life for sure. How are how, how are you liking self-tapes? Do you like self-tapes? Oh, well, you know, I think I'm now mastering it. But I have to say, Ooh. I had to make an investment into it. I was kind of half-assed doing it. And now, you know, I have the whole setup. I have the right lights. And I'm getting more and more comfortable. And what I'm learning as of late is that there, I rehearse. You know, I know those first takes most likely I'm not going to keep. But I start the rehearsal and I get it a lot faster than I used to. Yeah. I trust yeah. it um, and I have accepted it. I really did. Yeah. I was, you know, a bit angry, pissed off that this was being expected of us. And, you know, there's really no reason we can't go back in the rooms. Mm. I mean, yeah. there's a way to, you know, find a large room and separate if the casting director's worried from the talent. There are ways to do this. I'm not sure why. I think it has to do with money. I've talked about this with other guests. Like, why aren't we really back yet? But yeah. I've accepted it. You know, you can only fight it for so long. <laughs> yeah, what do they say in Star Wars? Resistance is futile. It's like trying to, uh, you know, uh, fight Darth Vader. Um, yeah, I, I think that the trap for, for a lot of actors is, is seeking perfection in their self-tapes. It's doing them over and over again in, in some... Uh, irrational chase of, of what the perfect take is mm. and that 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 flies in the face of what we know auditions to be which is kind of the messier the better and the more right. alive and free and the page in hand and you're yes. auditioning it, it shouldn't it shouldn't be a, a polished pristine short film and we're in this situation now where it's very hard when you're able to look at your takes to not go oh, I'm going to do another take and, and just keep right. working it Right. And, and because we're the camera person, the director, the, the lighting designer, you get caught up in the wrong things. Yeah, exactly. And right. so you have to prioritize what it's about. It has to be yeah. enough to show them, you know, what you can do and yeah. not be a finished product. Yeah, I agree. And, um, and ultimately, they're looking to higher higher energies and actors need to bring energy to everything they do. Mm -hmm. Energy. You, know, you should be uh, a, a tip for actors. You should watch. You should be able to watch your self tapes with no sound, and then honestly ask yourself: Do you find yourself interesting? Is what you're watching is there something alive and active happening with no sound? And if the answer is yes, then it's probably a pretty good take. If the answer is no, I look I look like I'm just talking, and there's no and there's nothing happening behind my eyes, and there's no there's no sense of urgency. Then no do behavior. it again. And bring something to it. Right. The body's you not have alive. To, you have to, Energy. Everything mm -hmm. is an energy. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. you, you, knowing the lines is kind of the bare minimum. You have to get past being off book and get into a place where you're bringing something that's electric. I know. And you got to get past being off book. That's a huge concern of most of my actors, you know, especially yeah, older actors. all they actors. think about is knowing the lines. I know. And you do have to know yeah. the lines. You can't substitute yeah. lines. You do. But you can practice that every day, that memorization skill think is something to practice yeah. okay so max is going to want me to wrap this up my producer because we uh this are was fun do 30 minute podcast but listen john uh is there anything uh, you know 
Okay, so you wrapped Joker. Rosebud Lane's coming out this week. You're in a really phenomenal place. Is there anything you want to say? I feel good. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say thank you because uh, you're always an inspiration. I've known you for a long time, and you're just you're a dynamo. And uh, every time I see you, I I, uh, I get happy. So uh, keep up the good work. <laughs> thank you. And if your if your followers, if your fan base, uh, you know, can find their way to Rosebud Lane, I would appreciate it. I think uh, Great. it's it's a film worth seeing. It, it's not it's not a Marvel movie. It's not uh, M Night Shyamalan. It's not big budget. It's not uh, you know. Uh, what you find at the Cineplex, but it's a, it's a heartfelt story made by a lot of people who really cared about it. Beautiful, beautiful. And, and yeah. where can people find you? Uh, Instagram? Uh, Instagram, my Instagram page is fun for actors because what I, every day I'm just, I'm, I'm posting films that I'm watching and, and a little bit of information about the film, a little, little trivia. That's Laceman34, L-A-C-E-M-A-N 34. Uh, so I guess it's at Laceman34. And then there is a Rosebud Lane film uh, Instagram that you could follow for, pro, you know, different okay, status do. and progress on the movie. Yes, yeah. please, everyone follow that. Let's support John. Let's support independent filmmakers. Let's support actors, teachers who are giving back to this industry, not just taking, but we're passing it on. Everything our teachers have taught us, um, our mm -hmm. high bar of what an actor can be what a director can be and so act is acting is about giving it's about generosity john and you have amen. that amen so anyone listening know that you have an obligation to pass it on to whether it's through your talent or your kindness or, or acts of kindness helping other actors that you know this is the kind of industry that we want to work in and the kind of artist we want to be. So thank you for coming today. Yeah. Uh, wish you You're the best welcome. of what luck. What a great way to sign off. Yes, Rosebud Lane. I, I love that sign off. Yeah, and generosity, that's what it's all about. Thank you, Rachel. This was this was a lot of fun. Thank, yeah. uh, thank you to Max. Yes, you got it. Have a great yeah. one.